All right, good afternoon, everybody, or good evening, wherever you happen to be watching this. Uh, this is actually being recorded um, in late October, so uh, pretty recent to when you're probably clicking on this. Um, just want to wish everybody, uh, if you see this, uh, obviously shy of Halloween, which you should, happy Halloween. And of course, as we make our way toward the back half of the semester here, um, we've got a bunch of uh, exciting subjects coming up, including journalism and books and also uh, advertising. But this is going to be all about film. And this is actually uh, part one of your film journey. There, of course, is lots to do in this uh, module. So I encourage you to look at the weekly tasks and see what you have uh, that you need to accomplish. In any event, I wanted to uh, start off, though, in part one by talking about kind of the general industry of film. And of course, uh, some recent headlines, which are out there. This is kind of a fun thing I like to do with, uh, with in front of every class, whether you're online or in person. And here are some of the more recent, uh, recent headlines, if you will. The production for the 1996 hit Twister, set for the long-awaited sequel in 2023. Of course, uh, Bill Paxton, Helen Hunt. Uh, I was a much younger man. Uh, when the first Twister came out um, and enjoyed it thoroughly. It kind of put tornado chasing, storm chasing on the map. Um, it's taken a while, but now what is that? Uh, some 16, 26 years later, uh, it looks like we're going to get a sequel. So um, Jan DeBont, by the way, directed the original. Um, the Revenant's Mark L. Smith uh, has written a script that is reportedly focuses on the daughter of Hunt's Joe Harding and Paxton, Bill Paxton being your co-star. Uh, Bill Harding, the hope is for Hunt uh, to make an appearance. Uh, according to uh, Deadline, we have Steven Spielberg to thank for the new forward motion as he loves the script. Universal and Warner Brothers are co-financing the film and are hoping for production to kick off next year. Uh, Bill Paxton, of course, will not be in the film because he obviously passed away uh, some time ago. In any event, Harry Potter star Robbie Coltrane recently uh, the, the character, I'm sorry, the actor who played the character Haggis passed away at age 72. He was a comedian actor. Um, he uh, originally, by the way, planned to become an artist. The young Coltrane pivoted to stand up comedy at Edinburgh clubs. When that aspiration didn't work out, he headed to London to explore acting opportunities, changing his name from Anthony Robert McMillan to Robbie Coltrane in honor of jazz great John Coltrane. That's kind of cool. Anyway, he uh, played Haggis uh, for, uh, you know, the longest time on, uh, on Harry Potter. Very sad to see him, uh, obviously, depart. Uh, Fantastic Four. Um, let's see. Let's see. We, uh, we suppose it was inevitable, according to the article here, once Blade was pushed back. But Disney and Marvel are juggling a batch of release dates for future movies from the studio and other mouse arms. I should say mouse house arms. Right, including a uh, Fantastic Four movie, the third Deadpool, and the Avengers Secret Wars. Deadpool, which recently announced the addition of Hugh Jackman as Wolverine, is on the move from the 6th of September 2024, with Blade slotting in there to November 8th of 2024. The Fantastic Four's full entry is shifting from a November date to February of 2025, and a yet-to-be-titled movie is headed off that spot, headed for November 7th, 2025. That date is significant because it was originally earmarked for Avengers Secret Wars, the second of the next two-part Avenger movie run. The first Avengers, the Kang Dynasty, is staying put as of right now, uh, and that release will come in May of 2025, which means that Secret Wars will no longer be six months after Kang, shifting instead to a year later, May 5th, 2026. So it's impressive that they're actually... Uh, you know, setting dates of movies that far out in advance. Uh, any Dungeons and Dragons doc? Or sorry, any Dungeons and Dragons fans? Well, there is a documentary set to come out in 2024. It's to coincide with the 50th anniversary, which will draw on the game's wizards and elves and archives, Dungeons and Dragons footage dating back to the game's creations in the early 1970s. Uh, it warms my heart because it was something I played back when I was in junior high school decades ago, and my niece is uh, apparently an avid player, so that's very cool. And then finally, uh, from the politics standpoint, because politics and film always have a tendency to intermix at times, following the release of its playbook for screenwriting in the age of climate change earlier this year, 
Good Energy, a nonprofit story consultancy, is now sharing its research study focused on the absence of the climate crisis in scripted entertainment today. Completed in partnership with USC Norman Lear's Center Media Impact Project, the study establishes a baseline for acknowledgement of the climate crisis in TV and film scripts written from 2016 to 2020. Quote, we started doing this research around this time last year, so it's really been a year-long process doing the research, getting the data, crafting it together to see what it means, says Anna Jane Joyner, founder of Good Energy. Going into it, we expected numbers to be low. Only 2.8% of all scripts analyzed, including any climate-related keywords, I should say climate change-related keywords. It's a pretty, gla pretty glaring absence when we're talking about a phenomenon that literally every human on Earth is experiencing in both intimate and collective ways. So that was affirming of our work and why we're doing all this. So, you know, USC obviously uh, doing a, um, a bit of research that, you know, as much as we talk about climate change or as much as the media talks about climate change and um, academics do, it's still not a huge part of the uh, Hollywood screenplay appetite nor television screenplay appetite. So I thought that was very interesting. So those are your recent headlines. Um, and uh, yeah, so there we have it. And it says up there some now COVID-19 related, I would say um, that's kind of a holdover, but I would say probably the fact that we're, um, I would say the sequels, Fantastic Four, Deadpool 3, Avengers Shift, a lot of that has to do with the fact that we've had a lot of, of COVID spent, you know, COVID backed up a lot of things. Um, so for example, you know, you saw Top Gun earlier this summer uh, that movie was supposed to come out, you know, long before it did. So in any event, uh, on we go. All right. Well, um, before I get into kind of the history of film and, and the evolution of film, I thought it would be interesting to kind of reveal to you um, what the American Film Institute or AFI uh, kind, of, kind of considers the top five movies of all time, because when we talk about film, there's always this endless debate about what's your favorite film Right. And what is the criteria for your favorite film? Um, so if you're, for example, a, you know, action adventure person, of course, uh, you probably like these summer blockbusters with all the, you know, the Avenger movies and, and the superhero movies. Some people love independent film. Some people like rom-coms, right? Romantic uh, comedies. Um, you know, some just like standard dramas. And so it's really interesting finding a baseline. So the American Film Institute, um, a few times in the past has kind of done this study where they uh, they basically surveyed a number of people to come up with the top 100 films of all time. And so I wanted to share with you the most recent list, which is not all that recent, but it's, you know, I think it's still uh, applicable. Uh, hold on, let me sip my Diet Coke here. They should sponsor me. Anyway, um, the number one film, or at least the, the film, according to the American Film Institute, that uh, is number one, is Citizen Kane. Um, it was made in 1942. It starred Orson Welles. And of course, you probably remember that name from radio. Remember we talked about War of the Worlds, that same Orson Welles. It's the fictional tale of William Randolph Hearst. Nine Academy Award nominations, uh, only one award, uh, one nominations, but only won one award, which is best screenplay, original screenplay, I should say. And it didn't do very well at the box office. So I think initially, basically, it was one of those films that I think people didn't appreciate until it kind of sort of, it, it sort of percolated a while. Um, well, that was Citizen Kane. It's particularly praised for its cinematography, deep focus shots, used camera tricks and placement, music and narrative structure, which have been considered innovative and precedent setting. By the way, Wells was given complete control of the film. So it really has his footprints or fingerprints, if you will, all over it. And during the production of Citizen Kane, um, he consumed 30 cups of coffee per day, which led to caffeine poisoning. And one other interesting note of Citizen Kane, because there are so many, is that William Randolph Hearst tried to keep it out of theaters. The real William Randolph Hearst, because he felt like it was uh, something, I think, a little too close to home. So we'll learn more about William Randolph Hearst when we get to journalism. But certainly, it's, it, Citizen Kane is kind of considered the gold standard of film. And again, I've left you the link on canvas so that you can look at a scene from the film or I encourage you to watch the film. It's pretty cool. Number two is Godfather, 1972. Um, that is Marlon Brando you're looking at with Al Pacino in the background. 
Fredo kissing his hand. I believe that's Fredo. Um, it's uh, starring Al Pacino, Robert Duvall, um, James Caan, uh, directed by Francis Ford Coppola, three Academy Awards, including Best Picture, Best Actor, and Best Adapted Screenplay. Godfather 2 also winning Best Picture, by the way. Uh, a famous quote from this movie is, I'm going to make him an offer he can't refuse. The story is uh, spans 1945 to 1955. It chronicles the family under the patriarch um, Vito Corleone, focusing on the transformation of Michael Corleone, played by Al Pacino, from reluctant family outsider to ruthless mafia boss. For a time, it was the highest gross movie ever made. A lot of people assume that this was the original mob film. And this is what started the genre. That is not true. Actually, Little Caesar uh, and Scarface were movies that were made much earlier, not the Scarface you know from, from Al Pacino fame, but from back in the day. So Little Caesar, I think, is considered the first mob film. Um, anyway, Marlon Brando used cue cards. Mob and Mafia, by the way, never uttered in the film. And Brando turned down his best actor over treatment of American Indians by the film industry. And I do believe that the American, uh, the Native American that went on stage to accept his award just recently passed away. Um, I, I don't know that for a fact, but I think I remember hearing that within the last week or two, which is kind of interesting. All right. Casablanca is your third film. That also 1942, like uh, Citizen Kane, Humphrey Bogart, Ingrid Bergman. Based during World War II and set in the Moroccan city of Casablanca, it focuses on American expatriate who must choose between his love for a woman and helping her Czech resistance leader, her husband, escape the vichy controlled city of Casablanca to continue his fight against the Nazis. It won three Academy Awards, including Best Picture, and it has its famous line, here's looking at you, kid. Um, one of the interesting things that, of course, you would see in these older films, uh, first of all, Humphrey Bogart was actually smaller uh, than Ingrid Bergman, so he's standing on an apple box. And then secondly, um, if you look at the film, if you watch the trailer, which obviously is on canvas along with that Godfather as well, um, you will notice that, that the, they used a very soft filter anytime they showed a female on screen. If it was a male like Humphrey Bogart, they had kind of a little bit harder look to him, which I thought was very interesting. Um, Raging Bull is uh, number four, I'm rolling, rolling you five. Raging Bull, 1980. It's all in black and white, even though it's in 1980. Uh, it was directed by Martin Scorsese. Uh, Robert De Niro plays J boxer Jake LaMotta. Joe Pesci from uh, Lethal Weapon fame, also in the film. You also might remember Joe Pesci from Casino, from Goodfellas. Uh, he just recently did a uh, he just recently did a, a film um, about Jimmy Hoffa that was outstanding. Anyway, um, he. Uh, called The Irishman. I was starting to think of it and read at the same time here. Great film. Anyway, uh, it was nominated for eight Academy Awards, one for Best Actor and Best Editing. In fact, if you study editing, Raging Bull is kind of the sort of the gold standard when, when sort of studying an action scene. Uh, it's very cool. In fact, if you look at the trailer that I have attached to this on canvas, you'll see what I mean. Anyway, Robert De Niro is Jake LaMotta, an Italian-American, or plays Jake LaMotta, I should say, um, an Italian-American middleweight boxer whose self-destructive and obsessive rage, sexual jealousy, and animalistic appetite destroyed uh, his relationship with wife and family. So it was inspired by Rocky, which was made in 1976, which also won Best Picture. Rocky, of course, being Sylvester Stallone's pride and joy. Actual boxer Jake LaMotta was on set for fight scenes, and Joe Pesci uh, was actually running an Italian restaurant at the time that you know the film was being put together and so Pesci was not a household name was just getting started and then finally number five 1952 singing in the rain with uh, Gene Kelly uh, Donald O'Connor Debbie Reynolds it was a comedy and a musical it offered a comical version of Hollywood's transition from silent to talkies two Academy Award nominations and uh, you know one of the more infamous scenes uh, where you see Gene Kelly uh, actually dancing in the rain. Actually, it was probably uh, a ton of water being piped in, you know, on the set um, at the studios. But one thing a lot of people don't realize is if you watch that scene, which is attached here to canvas, um, he was deathly ill. He was, uh, he had like 104 degree temperature. He shot the whole scene with the flu. Just a remarkable, uh, remarkable, uh, 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 you know, effort, I would say. And Debbie Reynolds, if you don't know who that is, 
was actually the mother of, of Carrie Fisher from Star Wars fame. And both Debbie Reynolds and Carrie Fisher died within, I want to say, like 36 hours of each other. Um, I'm guessing like six or seven years ago. It's just off the top of my head. Very sad. Anyway, most popular film of all time, right? So what this is, is adjusted for inflation box office wise. What was the, what is considered the most successful film? And one of those, of course, is uh, Gone with the Wind. Um, Gone with the Wind is number one. Um, basically, uh, it's Vivian Lee, uh, Clark Gable, infamous uh, scene, Frankie my, Frankie, my dear, I don't give a damn, made in like the late 30s. Um, and uh, it was 1939, I should say, um, and adjusted for inflation, just to show you, it would make uh, today, by today's standards, would be $3.92 billion. That's followed up by Avatar at 3.5, Titanic, um, which obviously was made in the 90s uh, at 3.26, Star Wars, the original. Oops, we got our, looks, our, looks like we got ourselves an extra dot there. Let me fix that. Um, anyway, 3.2 billion. 2.96 billion for Avengers Endgame to kind of give you sort of a uh, sort of a comparison. Speaking of money, um, I want to show you just how much money is involved with Hollywood and how much money and how much uh, money I should say how much uh, yeah money movies make. There we go. Try that three times fast. Um, now, why am I spotlighting 2019? Well, that is the last other than this year. I guess you could say this was like the last year that Hollywood wasn't affected by COVID. Um, because as you know, COVID struck in uh, March of 2020, it shut everything down, including movie theaters. And, and quite honestly, the movie industry has not yet recovered from it. Um, even though movie theaters have been open for quite some time, the fact is, is that our viewing habits have changed dramatically. A lot of, um, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, studios um, actually going through um, you know, going through uh, Netflix and, and Amazon Prime and Apple TV, et cetera. And so they're using streaming media in which to do first run films. That was not the case in 2019. And Avengers Endgame domestically, meaning here in the United States, made 858 million. This is number one. And the fifth all the way down to Captain Marvel at 428 million. So I'm sure many of you saw these films back in 2019. By the way, internationally, Avengers Endgame made 2.7 billion. And the top film, by the way, in 2018 was Black Panther at 700 million. Compare that to 2020, where essentially the world shut down in March and really never kind of you know restarted in terms of Hollywood that year. Um, and you can see that a significantly less amount of money was, was actually out there. Um, in fact, we hadn't even hit blockbuster season yet. And so um, essentially, Bad Boys for Life was the top earner at 204 million. Uh, 1917, which by the way, phenomenal film. I highly recommend it. Um, it's all about, uh, it's, it's like one, it's like a single camera kind of look, cinema verite style um, of, of World War I. And it, it's, it's, it's spectacular. Sonic the Hedgehog. Jumanji, Star Wars, Episode Nine. The only reason it was still up there was because it had been released the previous Christmas and it was had made. So you can see that, like, for example, Jumanji and Star Wars actually made a little bit more money, but again, got cut woefully short because of, of the pandemic. Now, now to today, top films of 2022, a season in which we are not under the pandemic in, well, Obviously, we're st we still have COVID, but you could say that there are the restrictions, uh, COVID restrictions in movie theaters have since eased. And you can see that we're getting a little bit more back to normal. Top Gun Maverick, 715 million. It's made 100, uh, 1.4 billion worldwide. Doctor Strange, the multiverse is in a distant second. Uh, and Jurassic World Dominion, those are your top three um, so far in 2022, looking a little bit more normal, if you will. All right. Um, by the way, if I don't have it on a later slide, so I want to say in 2019, I think total box office was around $12 billion. Um, and it was actually, it's only like about five right now. And we're already um, in late October. So 
clearly we're not anywhere near where we were pre-pandemic in terms of that. So, all right, how about most popular series? Well, that would be uh, the Marvel series, $27.4 billion. Um, that's how much Marvel has made. And as you know, uh, Marvel is a Disney, you know, Disney owned product now. Uh, so Disney obviously enjoying the fruits of, of not just Marvel, but the Star Wars franchise. Um, I, I can't remember the year, but several years ago, uh, you know, George Lucas sold his Star Wars franchise to uh, Disney for, I think, uh, if I remember correctly, just over $5 billion. And people said at the time that that was just insane. That was too much to pay. And of course, uh, I would say that that was probably a bargain, um, considering how many, you know, movies, Star Wars movies, Star Wars offshoot movies, Star Wars stories, Star Wars streaming, Star Wars, you know, fr uh, stuff at Disneyland, et cetera. Uh, you know, Disney has really, you know, turned Star Wars into an absolute behemoth of a franchise. Um, in my view, maybe a little too much. Um, I still remember episode four back in 1977. I saw it as an 11-year-old guy. And was mesmerized by it. And, you know, I, I think there's a little bit of a saturation point with the series, but it's making $10.3 billion. And that's why it's, uh, it's out there as much as it is. And then, of course, we have uh, DC Comics, most popular series, Spider-Man, right? Is Spider-Man DC? Oh, boy. You know what? I meant to look that up. You guys are out there probably screaming at your... Uh, at your um, screens right now, because I am not a, uh, I'm not a, the world's greatest comic book guy, but let me just double check. I'm pretty sure it's DC. Um, and you're probably like, Dave, come on, you should know this. And it is, um, no, it's Marvel, my bad, I stink. So it's seven, so Spider-Man actually the franchise is actually uh, so I guess that I guess technically if you combine Spider-Man and you uh, you know the Marvel series there you have it so I may have to go back and check on that but um, in any event the top two and then another big series by the way that got bumped was uh, the Bond series so James Bond all right my apologies guys I'm uh, you know I, I I am not all knowing as, as some would think all right other facts and figures annual box office in 2021. Uh, 2.9 billion. Okay, so I mentioned that that. Uh, uh, so we we talked about the fact that 2019 it was 11.4. Uh, in 2021, you can see how significantly lower that was. Of course, we're nearing six billion here this year. Um, so clearly, um, you know, I think definitely we're uh, we're seeing a we've seen a dramatic shift because of the pandemic in terms of how much money. Hollywood is making in the box office and how much our habits have changed, right? We're not going to movies as often as we did. Uh, you know, part of that is because I think, you know, there's still some people that are uncomfortable sitting in a crowded theater. I don't know if you feel that way, but I also would say that there's just so much more stuff that you can watch on streaming con or on, on Netflix and Hulu and HBO Max, et cetera, um, that we don't really feel, you know, like we need to go see a film, which is kind of sad. Um, average weekly attendance in the 1940s, by the way, reached 90 million. So when we get into uh, into film history, we're going to talk a lot about how much film had such a huge impact on society and how much it's kind of sort of splintered in the age of convergence. But um, it was as low as 18.5 million by 1992. That is a direct reflection, by the way. Um, that is a direct reflection, if you will, of... Um, of the fact of television, right? And, and of course, now the modern version of that is, is streaming media. All right, uh, late 1940s, you had 20,000 theaters. These were single theaters, by the way. But in 2010, we have less theaters, but more screens, meaning that in the uh, later, uh, in, in the more recent times, you know, we've had the, the invention of the multiplex where you go see a film and there's, you know, you know 15, 10, 15, 20, screens uh, on a property, and that's a reflection of that. Um, you know, if you would go back in your time machine some 80 years ago, it was always kind of a one, you know, if you were in a town, it was a one screen, one theater kind of experience. And, and I don't know if you've ever had a chance to do that. It's pretty cool. Um, the El Capitan Theater in Hollywood is certainly that experience. Um, you also, I, I remember in Wyoming, uh, I was in Cheyenne for about four years when I was in television. 
there was a single theater in Cheyenne. I mean, there was a multiplex by the mall, but there was a single theater that was pretty cool. Um, I remember seeing Dances with the Wolves there. I don't know why I remember that, but, you know, seemed cool. Um, and uh, if I remember correctly, um, the owner of um, David Packard, Hewlett Packard fame from the computer company, David Packard, spent part of his fortune opening up a single theater in Palo Alto that he runs up there by Stanford University. And so there's a certain kind of like appeal to it. So in any event, some more other, other facts and figures here. In 1943, Americans spent more than 25% of recreational expenditures on films. In 2019, American, so think about that. One uh, quarter out of every dollar went to uh, film. Um, and it just, it's, it just seems incredible that that, but that's how popular film was at one point. And this again, 1943 was pre-television. Remember television comes along in 1946 and we'll talk about television's effect on film here. Uh, in another lecture, but certainly very profound. In 2019, Americans spent nearly $60 on movies, parks and museums versus $42 on sporting events, $45 for plays or live theater. So still, even as recently as 2019, right before the pandemic, um, Americans still on average spend more money on films and, and uh, things like films than they do on sporting events or uh, live theater. Single people go to movies more often than folks who are married, believe it or not. I think that uh, is definitely something is definitely the case. Um, you know, I can tell you as someone who was in a much younger time um, and I was, you know, obviously uh, not married, didn't have kids. I found myself going to films all the time. Now I generally uh, feel compelled to wait to, to just watch them at home when I can do it when I have uh, my own, on my own time. It's more convenient. More males go to films. And it seems that older generations, many of which have kids that cannot be vaccinated, are now the ones that are less inclined to venture out to theaters. Or just in general, I think your over 50 crowd is more inclined to not go because of the fact that I think all of us over the last three years have gotten a little squirrely about being in crowded spaces, even though you know, again, pandemic certainly not over, but I think we're, you know, in general, I think we've definitely opened up society a whole lot more than we used to, but I still think there's a lingering effect of that as well. All right, last thing I want to talk about in part one, and then history of film will be in another lecture, is filming in the SZV, in the Santa Cruz Valley. So I'm coming to you from my office at College of the Canyons. I'm assuming most of you, um, if you're watching this and are in class, live here in Southern California. I got to figure that. I'm assuming a lot of you do live in the Santa Cruz area. Well, there's something called the 30 mile zone where we are in kind of Hollywood sweet spot for not just film, but television production, right? Now that's not to say that there isn't um, Hollywood, they're not studios, um, you know, in other places, New Mexico, has a huge production business, as does North Carolina. At one point, Michigan was uh, was pretty healthy. And then, you know, Vancouver, I, I don't know if it's still this way, but Vancouver was also very popular. And of course, there's also overseas productions in obviously in England, there's some in Croatia, uh, Australia was another popular area. But here in Southern California, back in 2016, when we had what was called runaway production. It was it was costly to do business here in California for a Hollywood or television production company because they because they were taxed, and so eventually um, they they basically um, started uh, giving them incentives, tax incentives, right? The state of California did to to try to lure kind of the production industry back here to Southern California. And they've done a pretty good job, and in particular, Santa Clarita has really kind of emphasized over the years being a very uh, film and television production friendly area. In fact, they have an office here called the Santa Clarita Film Office that, um, that handles it. That's, and we actually have someone here at the college because the college also recognizes uh, a lot of um, lucrative contract with Hollywood and, and, uh, and television. Um, at one point, I think the year before, COVID, we had made somewhere in the neighborhood of like five hundred to six hundred thousand dollars that went back to the college for all of the rental space that we would give to um, to, to to folks here at COC. 
Anyway, the total, total economic impact for location shooting in the Santa Frida Valley is $30 million in 2021. So last year, 570 film permits issued five, uh, over 1,500 film days. Television accounts for all, uh, um, sorry, for half of all production. There's 20 sound stages and there are 12 ranches. There's a studio right up the street from COC here called Santa Cruz Studios. And here are some of the many, many um, productions that have been shot here, NCIS, Westworld, uh, LA Fire and Rescue, Promised Land, Star Trek, Picard, Under Armour, music videos. These are all television production or you know, commercials. Um, I just, you know, every time the Super Bowl comes out, it just seems like, you know, you, you see at some point COC or Santa Cruz in the background and just about one out of every three or four ads. Um, films, by the way, include Space Jam, A New Legacy, Snake Eyes, 892, and Baby Stealer, some of the uh, some of the films, more recent films that are being made. So that is why I wanted to uh, start with part one here in terms of, uh, of film impact. Um, and uh, we will continue on with the history of film. Uh, that's it for now.